Welcome, Ilva Johansson. Uh, we're here in the Berlimont building in your office, the heart of the European Union, the center of policy making uh, in Europe. We'll talk about that in a minute, but let's first go back some time ago when you entered politics. I believe you were about 24 or something. What was your motivation to take that step at such a young age? I grew up in an area in a suburb of Stockholm where a lot of people with a lot of disadvantage start in life, so to say. A uh, high percentage of, of people with migrant backgrounds, uh, but also people with a lot of other uh, obstacles, uh, so to yeah. say, in, in life. And I thought when I was a child, I thought that uh, these different opportunities for people, it's like... Uh, um, a natural law, like some countries are hot, others are cold, some people are tall, others are short, and some people are poor and others are rich. And when I was a teenager, I realized, no, it's not true. It's because somebody have decided to. And then I, that immediately was for me a reaction that I have to do something against this. And then uh, when I uh, grew older and I really argued that we should really promote a, a, you know, a young, tough woman to, to be able to run for parliament. Mm. And then somebody said, well, you have to be a candidate then. And I said, oh, no, no. I can't. But yeah, some, you the have to do it also women. because, <laughs> I mean, if you say that this is important, it's the same. If it's important and you can do it, you have to do it. Were you already knitting then? No, not really. My, I, I learned to knit from my grandmother, but she passed away when I was nine years old. So yeah. then I stopped knitting and I took it up later. Yeah, because when people who follow you closely see you uh, at difficult meetings, you, you yeah. use it. Is it something you use to... Uh, A bit, <laughs> but I, I must also or... say that I've, first I found it quite difficult to come here and working in, in another language that's not my mother yeah. tongue. Yeah. So you will be tired in your uh, head, but it's really you have to concentrate on listening to other people. And then I found out uh, that knitting helps me to concentrate on listening. Oh, yeah. yeah, and it's not like you're looking into a paper or in your mm -hmm. phone or anything like that. So you concentrate on listening. And I need that really, because it's, yeah. it takes more energy to listen to another language than your own, at least for me. When you started, uh, you knew you were going to have a tough portfolio, but nobody predicted that we are going to have a war yeah. in Europe and also with an unprecedented uh, refugee crisis never seen uh, since World War II. You've traveled a lot there immediately to Poland, Romania, other countries. You spoke to the, the NGOs, the politicians, local politicians, and to the refugees, a lot of women and children. What, uh, what was the experience for you uh, as a politician and also as a person? I can tell you one story. Well, in, in, in Poland, uh, and the, the refugees, mostly women and children, uh, were brought from the border uh, to a reception uh, uh, center in a school. There were 200 beds in, a, in the sport hall of the school, a lot of uh, volunteers that provided with food, and there were a lot of of uh, clothes and toys and uh, pet foods that people have yeah. uh, been uh, given voluntarily. And I spoke to women uh, there uh, that said, well, we see here that there is a sign uh, saying that we can go with this car to that specific uh, place where we would like to go mm -hmm. because we know by somebody living there. And that was both this uh, how people immediately open their hearts, yeah. provide with homes, with help, with driving people everywhere. Uh, and that's really a warm hearted story. But you know, my portfolio also includes uh, criminal activities. Yes, exactly. And it's also very easy yeah. for a criminal uh, to sneak in, to pretend to offer people a drive yeah. to a safe, safe, safe place, yeah. and then actually uh, traffic them and use them for sexual yeah. purposes, for example, because yeah. they're in such a vulnerable yeah. situation. And I think this is really where it's so important that you can trust people, but it's also important that we have a law enforcement that can prevent you from being a victim of the criminals that try to, to take advantage of this situation.
we've seen, the vulnerability of women and children. I mean, these are refugees, but also in general. So last week uh, you proposed, you came up with proposals also to protect children against abuse and against abuse online. Can you tell us a little bit more on that? Yes, child sexual abuse is really is a heinous crime, but it's also a huge crime. Nobody knows exactly how big it is, but Council of Europe estimates one child out of five. I mean, it's really, really uh, uh, a huge crime. And very, very often, uh, children are being abused by somebody they trust in the family or uh, friends to the family, relatives, or maybe a sports leader or things like that. And this can go on for years, mm -hmm. you know. Children are so vulnerable and they are being abused sometimes year after year, and it's hidden, it's in the dark. And very often the only way to get to know about it is when the perpetrator posts it online. And of course, there's a lot of things to do. That's why I presented the strategy to fight child sexual abuse. We have to work with prevention, we have to work with law enforcement, with parents, with you know schools and, and with children directly. But there's a special thing with the online component, yeah. because here we need an EU law. You know, Europe is the, the biggest host of child sex abuse material. A majority of, of global material is hosted here in the European Union. Mm -hmm. That's why we need EU laws yeah. uh, to deal with this. And uh, for me, it's also a moral obligation. Like, I'm a mother, I'm, I have a moral obligation to protect my children. As an adult, I have a moral obligation to, to protect other children as yes. well. And as a politician, I think I have a moral obligation to use my power to protect children better. As a commissioner for home affairs, as we just heard, you are dealing with hard, difficult problems, not just figures on paper. It's about real people, it's about young children. Was it ever more relevant to be a European politician in these difficult times? Yeah, it's really, uh, I really feel, feel a privilege to be a commissioner in these very, very challenging times. And I wanted this portfolio. And of course, it's, uh, I have to be honest, it, it's a tough one, really. Uh, and I work so much <laughs> and it's really difficult sometimes. But it's also a possibility to really make a difference uh, for, for people. For example, we managed this temporary protection directive to activate it. That means that two, 0.7 million Ukrainian refugees right now are benefiting from this uh, decision. So then now we're back to the beginning where you told us why you entered politics. It still yes, keeps yes, you motivated. Yes, it's still, it's still there. You and, uh, yeah. and I really think uh, what's for me personal is really to use, uh, to do what you can do. Uh, and I think this is really the about politics, uh, not to have the biggest dream, you can have your dream, of course, but it's important to uh, not let the dreams stop you from doing what is the possible thing, the best and possible thing to do right now. And I think this is really uh, a driving force for me to look into, okay, now we have this situation, what is, the, what is possible to do? And out of those choices, what is the best one to do? And then we take next step and next step. Thank you very much, Ilva Johansson. Thank you.